Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us in the Rasmussen Theater for the last presentation of the 2023 Living Earth Festival. My name is Hayes Labus, and I work in the Museum Programs and Community Pro Programs Department here at the Museum. Hope you enjoy your visit, and we are going to be going into Sacred is the Taro Plant with Joey Palupe and Makuit Perry. They're going to be talking about traditional land management in Hawaii and the taro terraces and the stone fish ponds. We'll take, if we have time, we'll take a couple of questions at the end. The microphone will be right at the back, so please step up to the microphone. And without further ado, let's welcome. Hello, Mike Ako. Uh, before we begin our formal presentation, we'd like to offer a little bit of Hawaiian protocol just to kind of open the space and introduce you folks to uh, our, our understanding of the sun as to how it pertains to our water systems and how the sun motivates movement within our atmosphere. Hello, everybody. My name is Joey. Um, I hail from Kahalu. Um, I'm a resident in a place called Hakipu'u, and I'm a descendant of the larger land division and, and region of Ko'olaupoko on the island of Oahu. Pleasure to be here today, folks. Um, we're really excited to kind of share some of the stuff that we've been working on, and, and basically the Hawaiian community has been really driving us to, to push forward and bring an awareness to some of the things that are going on in Hawaii. Um, as it pertains to global issues around the world, we're also kind of experiencing those things. So this is our presentation title. Um, we've got a main presentation today and it's titled Eho'ina Hawaii, which means to return the waters. And we've got two kind of subdivisions of that. Um, Kapu Kahaloa, Sacred is the Taro, which will be presented by myself. And then following myself will be Ho'ike'a Iloko, Returning Life Within. And that will be presented by Makuali right after this. Um, there will be a short portion of questions um, kind of in the middle of the two presentations. That way, if you have specific you know, questions for me, there will be time allotted for that. And then same for Makua. Okay? So we're going to go ahead and get started here. So basically, the, the Hawaiian you know, agricultural system and aquacultural system and the livelihood of our people is really comprised of this social structure of an ahupua and this land division of an ahupua. So an ahupua is basically a land division that stretches from the mountain to the ocean. Um, it was a land division that was designed for a couple of different reasons. One was to kind of manage the, the natural resources within a certain area. One was to also control the people within that area. 
Okay, so here's some very important parts here. When it comes to land sustainability and agriculture in Hawaii, we're completely dependent on this concept of where are the waters of Kane? Or what, where do we find the fresh water in this natural landscape? Okay. So this is our Mahele Aina, or the different sections that are found within an Ahupua'a. We have three major sections that kind of break up a singular Ahupua'a. So if you imagine an Ahupua'a as a piece of pie, we're splitting it up into three different sections. Each section has a certain role within that system, and that system is connected through water. Okay? So we've got the upper region, which we call the Uka region, and that basically stretches from the uplands of the summit of the mauna or the mountain, all the way down to the tree line where the cliff meets the vegetation. Okay? Then you have what we call a Kula region, which is kind of the midland section, the flatlands, the mostly cultivated areas. Um, that's where the land starts to kind of flatten out, just below the cliff line. And furthermore, all the way down to the kai, we have the ocean. So that entire coastal line area stretches from basically the coast and any area that has a high amount of salinity found in the soil, all the way out to the, the outer fringing reef. So all of our resources from the fringing reef to the mountaintop are all included in this system of an ahupua'a. And they're all connected and they all have symbiotic relationships to each other and to the people. So how are these regions connected and why? Um, the main thing for us to really understand is they're all connected by water. Okay, so as the water collects in the clouds, um, you know, precipitation happens, rain falls, goes down into a waterfall, cuts down into a stream, cuts through the land and goes out into the ocean at some point. Okay? This concept of a ho'i na vire, to return the waters, is a very important aspect to what a successful ahupua has. If you're not returning the same amount of water that it's intaking back to the out of the cycle, um, you're basically disrupting that cycle and all the things that fall below it. Okay, so basically if you're looking at an ahupua system and the amount of water that's coming in through rain isn't matched at the outtake where it enters the ocean, there's some kind of disruption or there's some kind of displacement of water and that system is lacking in its ability to obtain certain resources and different agricultural systems. So this is one of the main uh, reasons for why our people did divert certain waterways. Um, they diverted waterways temporarily to, to farm an agriculture um, system that was primarily made up of lo'ikalo. Okay, so lo'ikalo is our Hawaiian word for Hawaiian ter uh, taro patches or taro terraces. And what you see here is terraces that are kind of diverted, um, or water systems that are diverted to, to grow this staple crop for our people. Um, this was the number one crop in Hawaii for a long time, um, and our genealogy as a Hawaiian people kind of trace right back to this plant. So it's a really important plant, not just nutritionally, but also um, when you talk about food sovereignty and what that means as far as cultural identity, this is the number one plant to us. Um, the importance of growing it really enhances our ability to manage our resources appropriately. So if we are growing this, because there's such high reverence over it, it, it's one of those indicators that our system from that point up is healthy, okay? Now, when we have taro patches today that are not necessarily um, at the top of the cycle, they might be kind of in the middle section of the cycle and you might have residential areas above it, you can imagine that there are potential threats that are not introduced that kind of disrupt that cycle. So what you see in Hawaii today is a lot of that disruption. You, you don't necessarily see landscape like this in the majority of the land that you're going to visit in Hawaii, in Hawaii. Um, but this is a goal for us as a people. This is a picture of current day in Hakipu'u where I work. Um, I work at Kulua Ranch and we're one of the top uh, tourist attractions in Oahu. Um, you guys might be familiar with the movie Jurassic Park, Jurassic World. This is the place that it was filmed. Um, I bring this up because it's important for us to kind of understand that there's this balance of what we need to do financially and what those funds could be allocated for if we make the right decisions. Um, we're not to the point where that's happening in a full business model in Hawaii yet, but like I said, this is something that we're working towards. 
So this concept of kapu uh, or sacred is the taro, right? This, this idea of a plant being sacred really highlights and identifies our importance that we place onto the value of aina or the value of land. Um, taro is one singular plant, but the concept really reflects a, a larger landscape and all of the natural cycles that are involved in the growth of taro, okay? Um, kapu is a line that's found in our Kumulipo, which is a 2,000 line long genealogical chant that stretches us back to the beginning of time um, in Hawaii with the first born living organism in Hawaii being the coral polyp, all the way into humanity and after that. So all the living creatures that are you know, listed as native in Hawaii were, were born in sequential order in this genealogy and it's a chant that was passed on through oral history for our people. Um, the very unique and cool thing about it is it scientifically checks out for the most part. So it validates our ancestral knowledge um, in a scientific lens as well. And Kalo, or Taro, was listed as the progenitor of the human population. So this was the one species born just before humanity in Hawaii. So we know and understand that we come from you know, a, a lineage of wayfinding and seafarers where we're traveling throughout you know, South Polynesia and making our way up eventually to Hawaii. That is where we come from, right? We're not born out of a, a taro plant, but the story tells us that we come from the same parents as that taro plant. Um, what that does is it offers us insight to kind of look deeper into what does this story actually mean? And it teaches us that you know, this is our older brother and our older brother will feed us as long as we take care of him. So that symbiotic relationship between man and natural resources is very reflected, very reflective in uh, the things that we teach our children, the genealogy that they come from, the identity of our people. Okay, so this is uh, another uh, tie-in to what we call mo'olelo or oral history in Hawaii. And we talk about migrational stories um, Every mo'olelo that we have can, can be kind of understood in a very migrational way, meaning traveling overseas or reasons to travel throughout sea um, to explore new land or find new resources or figure out what is the best suitable place for us to exist. Um, the story of Kane and Kalanoa really highlights two famous navigators, famous travelers, um, but they were born as Akua or they're born as entities that are superior to the human race. They're born as the entity of fresh water and the entity of the ocean water. So these two water sources um, in story, in the Mo'olelo, they kind of travel throughout the Pacific. We have similar stories found in New Zealand, similar stories in Tahiti. They call them by the names of Tane and Tangaroa. We call them Kane and Kanaloa. Exact same stories and reasons to kind of travel the areas. And what they do is they're searching for fresh water to consume ava or kava. Um, this is found throughout all of Polynesia, but basically in, this, in these orally passed down stories and accounts of these two people, they're traveling around Hawaii, they're finding the fresh water, but they're also naming it, locating it, and basically bringing it into light and consciousness for us to access later. So all of the waters that are mentioned and the places that they find it, we have them documented through chants, through oral history, um, and it's really important that we kind of look back to those things because that's the most traditional context that we can get and indicators of how our people saw the world 500 years ago. Um, yep, so we got this right here, a little bit of Olelo Hawaii, a little bit of Hawaiian language for you folks. So vai is fresh water and it's also connected to the word wealthy. So in Hawaii, vai vai is, is a word for wealth or to be rich. And that shows that we put a high priority and value on fresh water. So if you had fresh water, you were considered rich. That, that was our way of viewing the world. You know? Then we have Ahupua'a, which we were talking about earlier, that land division from the mountain to the sea. Then we have Lo'ikalo, those taro terraces that we talked about. Um, and how all of that ties in is really looking at who we are as a Hawaiian people without access to these resources, right? If we don't have access to water, if we don't have access to do the things that we consider our connection to land, are we really connected to land, right? Um, 
we're going to move forward. I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that are probably going through your head and like, okay, so what is the problem, right? There's all this great, magnificent information that we can learn from our ancestors and learn from their way of life. How does that apply to today? And, you know, for those of you who have visited Hawaii, I'm sure you, you kind of understand where I'm going here. Uh, for those who haven't been to Hawaii, it's, it's become a place that's really over-commercialized, over-visited, abused, taken advantage of. Um, and these are some of the things that are prevailing in the news today. And this is kind of the general consensus of what community members might tell you if you ask the local resident, what are some of the struggles you guys face, right? So we got things like overpopulation, we've got limited access to fresh water, this concept of being priced out of paradise, um, all of that comes with overdevelopment, all of that comes with the influx of, you know, the visitor community, but also their desire to live there. Um, but not really fully understanding our role as people in our natural environment before we live there. So that's, that's really important for us to kind of grasp and understand. Um, and then we also have this, this massive issue of Native Hawaiian population decrease in Hawaii. So in general, the Native Hawaiian population in the U.S. is increasing, but in Hawaii specifically, it's decreasing to the point where there's, there's more Native Hawaiians outside Hawaii than there are in Hawaii. Um, we see that as problematic because our ability to not connect to the place that we're from um, displaces us as a people, but it also removes our connection for the future generations from that point forward. It makes it even harder for them to return. Uh, climate change, we all know about it. It's the craziest buzzword since 2008. Um, it is a real thing in Hawaii. We see massive change because of this, this idea of climate change. Um, I think it's a little controversial depending on who you, who you ask in Hawaii because, you know, I've talked to elders who've told me climate change is normal. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm stumped and I'm like, oh, what do you mean? You know, and they, they come to me with this idea of if you look at the trajectory of our people and how every two to four thousand years we migrate, that's based on climate change. That's based on sea level rise. That's based on displacement of, you know, water or resources and the need to move and then potential to move back later. That happened throughout history within our stories. Um, so there's that take on it, but there's also this, this need and understanding that population is not positively affecting that change, right? We're not doing our part to kind of combat this change and the quickness of it. Um, but in Hawaii, you know, we have, we have a climate and an environment that can produce a plant 20 times faster than anywhere else in the world. So you can imagine that the change that you folks see here is exponentially, you know, bigger back home because our environment moves faster. Um, we don't really have the four seasons that everyone has here. Um, we have the ideal climate for most tropical plants to exist. And we also have a pretty optimal climate for, you know, storms to happen and that kind of thing. When, when we do get storms and we do get inconsistent weather patterns because of climate change, we're dealing with things like coastal erosion. We're dealing with things like, you know, um, most recently we had this like series of five days where every single day there was a sinkhole on one of the main roads on Oahu, cutting off, you know, the emergency line traffic to major towns within our island. So when we're dealing with those things and, you know, sinkholes and then roads sliding into the water, in the ocean, you know, that can be a, a, a major disaster for our people um, and a bigger reason to want to move away. So, you know, with, with all of these issues that, that arise, we got to ask ourselves, okay, well, what do we do, right? Like, what are we doing to actually make some kind of change? And this idea of makahana kaike comes from the words of our kupuna, the words of our ancestors, and they're basically telling us the knowledge that we're trying to teach people is in the doing, right? So we can talk about it all we want, but until you put your hands in the soil in Hawaii, only then will you really know Hawaii, right? You can conceptualize in your, in your minds what this might mean, but again, until you're doing it, you really don't know. 
Yeah, so what we're trying to do is encourage people to, to actually do it, right? And if you can't be there in Hawaii to do it, that doesn't mean you can't do it. You can also connect with places of your own. You can connect with, you know, those, those places that mean something to your ancestors. Um, and all of those things will validate your understanding to, to better support this type of stuff in Hawaii. Yeah? Um, what we're realizing is we've gone too long with holding our knowledge to ourselves in, in somewhat of secrecy and that was kind of stemmed from the oppression of the Hawaiian culture, right? Through the early 1900s into like 1970, it wasn't a good thing to be Hawaiian in Hawaii. We had people changing their names from Hawaiian last names to Smith. We had people changing their names because they wouldn't be anywhere in life if they hadn't done so. Um, a lot of our history was erased from our people and our people felt that that was needed in order to advance. Um, so the, the little information that we have now has been passed down almost through secrecy, right? But that naturally kind of makes us very, very uh, tempted to not share with others because we have this feeling of like, we fought so hard to get this back. What makes you think you have the right to, to know it, right? That ends up almost crippling us in a way because all the things that we hold significant and sacred to us, nobody else understands, but we also don't give them the opportunity to learn it. So really what we're trying to do in today's world is hopefully educate others a little bit more about it, just so that there's exposure and they can engage in it, understand it, and then support it, right? So sustainability, this is a massive goal for Hawaii. It's been a goal for a long time. Um, you know, our, our state has proposed this 2030 goal that by 2030 will be 50% um, self-sustainable in Hawaii. Um, Makua will share a statistic with you later that'll kind of show you that that's definitely not gonna be met because we rely so heavily on outside resources that if we were to completely go 50% relying, our systems can't provide that. Right? We don't have the access to these natural resources to re-engage in that work, um, but it's not stopping us from creating the goal. Right? So we can still strive to get there. Um, I listed these things here because I think they all fit into the plan of how we're gonna get there. Um, the new term that's being flown around the world is this idea of regeneration or regenerative tourism. We're not even at a sustainable tourism yet. So in order for us to regenerate and be a place that can continue to feed itself, we've got to at least have boots on the ground and be sustainable, which we're not. So this idea of food sustainability is almost hand in hand tied to that financial sustainability and economic drive for our people, which is why I think tourism is taking a step forward to say, we need to commit to this a little bit better because we're doing nothing right now. Um, and from that, you know, the, the hope is that those two things can also benefit the cultural growth of the Hawaiian people. Because without those things, um, that cultural integrity is not going to thrive. It's not going to be, you know, held to the caliber it needs to be. And it's not going to be prioritized. So this is a quick moment of uh, questions. If you guys have any questions specifically for me, um, we've got a couple minutes before we transition over to Makua. In Hawaii, we say, you shame, you lose, which basically means when you get asked to speak, you better speak, otherwise you forever hold your peace. All good? Oh, question? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, I work at a place called Kulo Ranch. Um, it's a 4,000 acre private nature reserve. It was purchased from the Hawaiian monarch, Kaui Keoli, King Kamehameha III, um, to a white doctor in, in 1850. So that purchase um, 
sort of came with a promise to the family to kind of uphold and maintain that, that piece of land without developing it in, in a way that would look like the rest of Hawaii. So that's been kind of the direction that the, the ranch is striving to be at. But it does come at a, a really expensive price. So, you know, when they talk about financial sustainability in a place like that, it's easy to say, you know, Jurassic Park's gonna cut you X amount of dollars to film here. And, you know, there's been 200 plus films on that ranch. So it is like the main money maker of the place. But now we're at a place where they've generated so much income that they need to make responsible choices with the money that they have. So they're putting a little bit more emphasis on initiatives like this. Um, so previous to my employment there, I was a school teacher uh, for a Hawaiian school on the same island and, and I was teaching this concept of aloha aina or caring for your land and, and being passionate about loving your land. Um, I was teaching that in the middle school. So that work kind of transitioned over into this private sector because I, I saw an opportunity to make a change. I saw an opportunity to uh, kind of pitch something new to this, this industry, the tourism industry, because that is the driving force of Hawaii right now. And you know, should, should things kind of move away from that, I, I will forever follow my land. So that's kind of where, where it's putting me right now. <laughs> but yeah, it's a heavily visited place. Um, Oahu gets over 30,000 visitors a day. And I would say about four to 6% of them every day end up at Kulo Ranch. So that's, that's a pretty big draw if you're considering how many people are on island um, at any given time. So we do have a good opportunity to kind of pitch this change. And if it, if it follows through, then it could be a good model for other people to follow. Yep. So we, um, we have, do you say airplane services? So we have, we have, of course, an international airport um, in Honolulu. There is a Hawaiian Airlines, but it's actually owned and based in California. Um, there is no locally owned, like, international airlines. Um, the airport is state funded. And uh, yeah, we, we do have an airport and, you know, major ports for barges to come in and out with supplies and whatnot. So we're, we are very modern in, in a sense, if that's what the, the question might be. Um, we do have modern technology. We actually had electricity in our Queen's Palace before the White House. So, you know, we, we were, sorry, we were very much advanced to that, that uh, technological standard. Question? Yeah, so she's asking, uh, you know, what are, what are the thoughts behind how do we get to sustainable tourism and then making it regenerative? Uh, basically, sustainable tourism means we can sustain it with whatever we're putting in, we're getting out. Regenerative comes in a, in a time where you're putting in something and you're getting out more. So a regenerative approach would be something like, you know, a tourist is... is coming to Hawaii and then paying to basically do ecotourism opportunities. And that's leaving an imprint and a positive impact on the land, right? So that's where something could be regenerative. They're, they're paying for it and it's not taking out of, you know, our ability to provide a paycheck to, to a farmer, but it's also leaving the farmer with more than they got when, at the end of the day. Um, so that's kind of the, the main approach right now. Um, we're trying that regenerative model in certain spaces that can kind of afford that and, and take that gamble and run that chance. We're not yet equipped to, to go very large scale with it yet, um, but there's commitments made by the state to get there. Yes. The, the United States government, um, you know, it's, that's very debatable. They're, they definitely have a presence in Hawaii, a very large presence in Hawaii. Um, 
there's a lot more harm than help, I think, at this point, especially to our natural landscape. You know, one of our islands was used for a long time for major bombing, bomb testing during World War II, um, and then all the way into the 90s, um, or sorry, the 80s, when it actually stopped. But it's, uh, that's an example of kind of the, the presence of the federal government in Hawaii. It's, it's very military-centric, um, and that's not very parametered by the needs of the environment. Um, one of the big issues that we're running with right now as it pertains to water is massive um, jet fuel leaks into our main aquifer on the main island of Oahu. Um, so you guys might have heard of Red Hill. That's still an issue that's happening. It hasn't been addressed. Um, there's still jet fuel in the main aquifer cutting off about 20% of the island's freshwater supply. Um, and people are living off of bottled water in those areas. And we're finding traces of jet fuel spreading. And that's, that's not the only leak that has happened throughout time. So, you know, there's just consistent harm to major resources for sure. So the, the big hotel companies that end up there, you know, they're the same major hotel chains that are all over the world. Um, they are a beneficiary of the beautiful landscape and paradise, but there's little to no effort in keeping it that way um, because it's, it's, it's very survival based in a sense where you got to do what you got to do to make money. And if that means not focusing on the land because that costs money, then that's what they're going to do. Yeah, I don't think there's any, there's, there's none that I can recall that are locally owned, no. But um, I'm gonna transition. I can totally take more questions at the end of this, but I do wanna give Makua the chance to present even more great information. Um, but thank you folks, we'll connect in a little bit. Okay, aloha mi kako. Uh, hello again. My name is Makua Lee Perry and um, yeah, I'm taking the second half of this presentation to talk a little bit more about our Ahupua system as it relates to uh, Native Hawaiian fish ponds. And so, Hoikea uh, Iloko, returning uh, life within, returning life within our natural landscape and also to uh, protect our resources as it, re as it pertains to our coastal management. So just a really quick uh, recap of what Joy had already um, shared with you folks, yeah? Um, we have an Ahupua system, a land division that goes from the mountains down to the ocean that is all connected by water. Um, Ali'i were those who had uh, primary uh, control over these land divisions. Konohiki were the land managers that were under these Ali'i um, or, or chiefs. And Maka'ainana were the commoners, caretakers of the Aina or the land that were um, helping to carry out all of these different responsibilities that help to make these ahupua or land divisions very sustainable for their people. So, Alokoi'a is a native Hawaiian fish pond, and um, loko in Hawaiian means pond, enclosed inside or interior, and i'a means fish, yeah? And so, loosely translated, it is a fish pond that you will find in the coastal areas of Hawaii, and also in a little bit of the inland areas um, of the coastal land as well. And so they're built with all natural material, all stones and, um, and branches, and also cordage that was made from different natural materials as well. And they're sourced from the aina to serve the aina. So everything sourced from this fish pond is all built within the natural landscape, and it's uh, used to serve the aina, which is both the land and our, um, our oceans and our nearshore fisheries. So the reason why that's really important is looking at the function. It's a traditional man-made estuary. <clears throat> excuse me. It's a traditional man-made man estuary, um, but the whole concept of a man-made thing, pe people kind of get this misconception that you're creating something for the better of human beings. But the really interesting and most important aspect of a lokoi'a or a fish pond is that when you create something like this and it naturally fits within your landscape, you're actually trying to improve the living conditions and the life cycles of all of your marine animals. So, um, yeah, a steward site to promote abundance within the nearshore fishery and the service of these local, as I mentioned, the first and uh, 
foremost primary is the fish and the landscape, and the second is the people. So there are six types of lokoia or fish ponds that you can find in Hawaii. They're all traditional and um, have been created uniquely for um, their particular land divisions and landscapes. The one that's starred in the middle uh, top is the type of fish pond that I work at. It is called a loko pu'u'one, or it's a sand dune or sand mounded fish pond. So some people might see uh, brochures or anything about Hawaii and you'll see these big rock wall fish ponds that are built into our nearshore fishery. Ours is a little bit different. You'll actually see on the North Shore where we're located that it's inland a little bit, maybe about 50 yards from, uh, from the coastline, and it's connected by both fresh and saltwater resources. So how many fish ponds were there before Western Contact? There were over 400 lokoia, and now there's less than 80. Yeah, and um, one of the nonprofit organizations that our nonprofit is affiliated with is called KUA, or KUA Aina Ulu Awamo, and they are responsible for gathering about 40 uh, fish pond organizations across the state to help to uh, revitalize the, the practice and to also collaborate and partner with each other to see if we can find better solutions within our islands or in multiple islands to make our efforts of putting local uh, or fish ponds back on the map um, and to make it more accessible for the education of our youth and also for anybody else who wants to learn about what sustainability really looks like in Hawaii. And so this is a quick little map of, um, that I found from, from KUA that kind of highlights all of the different fish pond organizations that you could actually visit today. And um, so you can tell that most of the Hawaiian islands are all um, collective. They, they collectively um, have lokoi'a all around um, different districts. And so for us on Oahu, that little arrow is pointing towards the fish pond that I'm located at, which is Loko Ea and also Uko'a fish pond. So Loko Ea is where, is where I work. Um, it's a nonprofit organization that stewards and, and is helping to restore this uh, particular fish pond on the north shore of Oahu, Loko meaning pond, as I said before, and Ea has three different definitions, which means to rise, it is also your breath, and it's sovereignty. And so the sovereignty that we really talk about with um, our groups and, and to try to get people to understand is that it's not just about sovereignty and independence as a nation, but it's actually food sovereignty that we like to preach with our people. Yeah, because within these systems, there are so many different pieces of this ahupua'a that work collectively to make a society functional and also productive. And without lokoi'a, you are losing a huge resource for your community. So food sovereignty within these particular coastal um, systems is really, really important for an indigenous people to survive. So one of the, um, uh, the biggest thing about fish pond systems, or many of them that we have in Hawaii, is they are a mixture of vai, which is fresh water coming from the mountains, and it flows and mixes with the kai or the salt water from the ocean, yeah? And it creates vai kai, yeah? So just taking those two um, words together, putting, putting them into this context that brackish water cultivates a very rich environment for algae and phytoplankton to grow, and through that process of creating an estuary that is naturally fitted into your landscape, you do find that all of these smaller pua or these baby fish that are, that are spawned out in the ocean, they're all enticed and attracted to come into your system based on all of that goodness that's cultivated within your fish pond system. So one of the things that you can see in this picture is um, we like to highlight our gates. If the ocean, and our streams of fresh water are kind of like the arteries for our fish pond. These gates or these makaha are our, are our lungs, yeah? It's the way that we can breathe in salt water and fresh water into our systems every single day based on the tidal changes that we have in Hawaii. So this is kind of like a quick little snapshot of what a makaha would look like today. Uh, traditionally, it would be made, it would be lashed with branches and also cordage. And right behind that is our more contemporary system that we are now taking over at our fish pond. And so when it comes to all of, um, all of this, this greatness of a system um, that we have from our ancestors, 
it's pretty ingenious in the way that you entice fish um, through a naturally occurring system that produces food. And when the fish come in, they come in very, very small, yeah? All of these holes that you see inside of our, our contemporary gates are small enough to where only baby fishes can come into our pond. And so through that, they eat, they have a great time, like, you know, taking from this resource, and then sometimes they'll go back home to the ocean. But after a certain size, they'll start to make the decision whether or not I want to stay inside of the fish pond or whether I want to go back to the ocean and live my life in the ocean. And it's that choice that's really, really important because we're not trying to create a system that's forcing fish to come in and to be happy or force them to be happy. But they're here in our system because they are happy and they're living in a life of abundance uh, because of this fully functioning system. So with these fishes, yeah, we love to um, take care and steward our prized herbivorous fish. Um, these two over here are the prized fishes of Hawaii traditionally used to take care of our ali'i or our chiefly class systems, the ama'ama -ama or the striped mullet, or the native Hawaiian striped mullet, and also the ava or the milkfish. These fishes can grow up to about three and a half feet and they can get very, very large and fat. So um, the abundance of, this, of these particular species of fish is what helped to create a very sustainable um, fishery for our people. So coming back to a little bit of the uh, statistics that Joey mentioned, right? About 90% of the food that you find in Hawaii grocery stores are actually imported from other spaces. And that's a very alarming number. It was a little bit higher before the pandemic, but now that we're kind of in this state where we're starting to realize that after the panic of a pandemic, we need to find ways to bring food back into our system so that we can feed our people from Hawaii. And the um, biggest thing is, you know, with a lot of um, visitors coming from different spaces as well, all of these resources that are imported are not just for the local people, but it's also to support the tourism industry as well and the great numbers that we have coming every single day. So for us as uh, stewards of these particular fish ponds or even lo'ikalo or other species that produce food in Hawaii, this number is what we're trying to bring down. And so hopefully collectively, as we partner with each other and do the great things and restore all of these different native landscapes that start with water, bringing water back from the mountains and letting it flow freely all the way down to the oceans, we can come back to somewhat of a replica of what our kupunara ancestors have perfected for thousands of years before Western contact. So negative contributions, we kind of talked about a little bit. Um, agricultural and aquatic pollution, that comes with development and all kinds of other um, maybe uneducated choices and movements that people have, have made throughout the years of not really respecting or, um, or maintaining water systems or even land systems based on, you know, misrepresentation of, of, um, of certain educational opportunities to learn more about, your, about where you are and where you're from. Uh, introduced invas invasive species are a huge problem for our particular systems of fish ponds, mainly because when you have a fish like tilapia that can mature their reproductive organs in only one year, you now see a huge decline in our native fish population because there's too much of an overproduction of our invasive species. And they take up all of the resources and now there's a huge competition that right now invasive species are winning. And so gentrification and mismanagement of natural resources is, is another big one that we've been definitely highlighting throughout this presentation. So biggest reason why we're doing what we're doing is for restoration and revitalization, yeah? How is it that we can get people to be excited about coming back to these spaces and being a part of the solution so that we can, as a collective community, get back to a more sustainable Hawaii? So, just a little bit of information. A fully functional fish pond system is four to six feet in depth. It's, um, and it can produce upwards of 600 pounds of fish per acre per year. So local and, and wuko'a um, fish pond, these systems are about 110 acres large, which means you can, it can yield 66,000 pounds of fish per, uh, per year if they are all fully functional. So our restoration and revitalization efforts are helping us to maybe accomplish this in the future. And um, so yeah, our system today, based on erosion and a lot of um, 
mismanagement of our natural resources. We're looking at only two foot uh, depth within our entire fish pond system, which is very, very shallow. It creates a very lethargic environment for our fishes to live in. And um, because it's unfunctional, um, there is no fish production for our community at this time. So we're trying to beef up our numbers of production so that we can finally give to our people and make it more of a sustainable practice. And I think that's what a lot of local people and maybe even non-locals who come and learn about it um, should probably have a better understanding of because there's so many people, especially Native Hawaiians, who want to have this resource and we want to give it to them. But the biggest thing is if we give you all the fish now, there is no fish that's going to be here for three to four, possibly even 10 generations later. So um, the restoration effort is a long one, but it's necessary. And so the more that we continue to educate people about why it's important and why buying fish from the store should be, produ or should be produced and locally sourced instead of being brought in from you know, Thailand or other places in Southeast Asia, you know, that's the type of perspective that we want everybody to come home with. So that's our presentation. So we can have a little bit of Q&A for, for me too, if you guys want, or I guess we both can come up and talk about it, but yeah, any questions? Yes. Yeah, so, so the question is how, how ambitious should, um, or are we really looking forward to get that 90% down to a more reasonable number? And I think that's, I mean, that's something that I feel like we don't necessarily have all the solutions with between the two of us. It's a collective um, movement that we all need to kind of get on board with. And it starts with, it starts with our, our grassroots, you know, farmers and fish pond practitioners. And hopefully when we have platforms like this to share it with the community and share it with other people outside of Hawaii, we can come to a more collective understanding that these are really important and we can find our way to that solution. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll just drop a quick comment on that. Like, you know, the ambition comes from the desire out of disparity and need, right? Um, during a time of COVID, if you're in Hawaii, you would understand the need because there were moments of, we might not have a barge coming in, hunker down for two weeks because that's how much food we have on island. So if we, if we run out, we run out and that's it. You know, and that's, that's hotels included, that's communities, that's schools, that's everybody, hospitals. You know, so that, that ambition is definitely driven by the seriousness of the situation that we're kind of tasked with. And that's when the state finally made decisions to, to make those sustainability goals and agricultural goals to increase that, um, the support for these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so primarily Asia and the US. So Asia provides a lot of our Asian foods, of course. Um, we have a massive Asian population, but our proximity to Asia is almost the same as the US. So we're co-dependent on those two countries or those two land masses to, to supply everything that we have. I think the, the major change will happen when our exports are greater than our imports because that'll mean that there's higher value on what we have rather than uh, just going kind of the easy route and, and bringing things in. Um, 
specifically talking about a time of plantations, that was a situation where our exports were much larger than what we were actually bringing in. So that system kind of worked to the benefit of the people who own the plantation, mainly because of that situation. And, um, you know, pre-America, um, Kamehameha the Great put, put a tariff-free kind of export fee on some of the main harbors, specifically the one in Kauai Hai. And a lot of the sandalwood was shipped out of there. And that's what really started that industry of exporting. But they are exporting so much natural goods that we ran out. Um, so it wasn't set up in a way for a long-term success, but it was quickly converted into, you know, sugarcane and pineapple because of our ability to have pre-diverted water that normally fed back into the stream, but those systems broke that diversion away and never really returned it. So the entire system kind of got flipped. Yeah. Yes. Do one more. Yeah, we're going to... Um, we're going to visit you right after this, if that's okay. We do have um, the presence of one of our community members and you know, a great advocate of, of KUA um, with us today. So we, we did want to close with him. Um, I'll, I'll let Makua introduce him because he works very closely with him. Yeah. yeah, so coming up right now is Keith Chang. He is uh, the director for KUA Aina Ulu Awamo, which is the organization that has helped to create um, this hui or this this collective gathering of fish pond organizations in Hawaii, and um, yeah, we just wanted to make sure that we highlight um, all of his great work and just have him speak a little bit about it, and uh, we'll end with a little bit of extra stuff too. Extra stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I work for an organization called Kua Aina Ulu Awamo, which means grassroots growing through shared responsibility. Our, our acronym KUA means back, like a backbone we work to connect community efforts across our state to talk about natural resource management, cultural revitalization, and self-governance. <clears throat> so I, I just wanted to close with a song from Hawaii for you all. The song is called Hawaii 78. It was written in 1978 when the Hawaiian community was, began a movement to end bombings on the island of Koho'olawe, to reclaim a culture of navigation, uh, and to reclaim aloha aina, or to bring back the love for the land. Um, the work they, they do is called malama aina. Aloha aina is a sentiment. Malama aina is an action to care for your place. And the chorus of this song is uomao keea oka aina i kapono, which, which is the state model. It means the life of the land shall be perpetuated in righteousness. And remember now, when you learn the word life, ea, it didn't just mean life as in breath, but it also meant in life as in governance. And so I think some of the questions out there have a lot to do with how we're able to govern our community. So, songs called Hoi Simi. Sacred ground now 
how the film of a modern city light. Tears would come from each other's eyes and they would start to realize that our people are in great, great danger now. Cry for the gods and cry for the people, cry for the land that was taken away. Still yet you find Hawaii, Uama, Keokaina, Ikapono, Hawaii. Oh, the fighting that the king had done to unite the islands now is called the million. How would he feel if he saw Hawaii today? Oh, the giving that the queen had done, she gave her aloha to everyone now. How would she feel about this modern city life? How oh, 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 would they feel? Would they smile, be content, or then cry? Cry for the gods and cry for the people. Cry for the land that was taken away. Still yet to find a way. presentation and we'll be happy to have more conversations outside. Um, we do have a table in the middle, so we'll see you guys out there. Mahalo.